right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the National African American Missions Council's Table of Brotherhood series. It's the final iteration for this year's Black History Month. Welcome to Shades of Sisterhood, addressing the state of women around the world. We're so excited that you all are here uh, for this very important discussion that we're about to have. Uh, my name is Kanita Benson. I'm the founder of She Saves a Nation, which is a nonprofit and global ministry initiative that evangelizes, disciples, and empowers girl survivors of tribal war in Kenya, uh, Uganda, and uh, Myanmar refugees in Thailand uh, to become leaders who will change their nation, who will advance the kingdom of God and change the world. I'm also the director of intercultural prayer and missions for the National Day of Prayer Task Force. And I am your moderator for today's discussion. I wanna thank uh, Bishop Perrin and Pastor Adrian for passing the mic to the ladies today for this very crucial conversation. So today we have an incredible panel before us. Let me tell you all, this would probably equate to about a hundred years of experience in serving women's needs globally and cross-cultural engagement and global discipleship. So today we wanna welcome the Reverend Dr. Liz Rios, uh, Mrs. Gina Thomas, Pastor Lauren Jacobs, Yoknam Dabale, PhD candidate, Dr. Bethany Haley Williams and Ms. Kayon Watson. I'm gonna allow these women to introduce themselves individually uh, so that you can get to learn more about them, where they're from and their ministry context. So Dr. Rios, why don't you share with us uh, where you're from and all the incredible work that you do. Hello everyone. I just wanna thank uh, the uh, council for inviting me to be a part of this today. And I am from, originally from New York City. I live now in South Florida, very close to Miami. And um, for the last several years, I've been working uh, with women uh, as the Center for, for Emerging Female Leadership founder. And recently, um, I started working with women who were church planting in various cities um, through my ministry called Passion to Plant. And um, we work specifically with black and brown uh, church planters that are interested in starting justice oriented churches uh, around the country. And I'm also a council member of Silence is Not Spiritual, which uh, focuses on helping women who have had spiritual and sexual abuse in the church. So, and I identify as an Afro Latina or Afro Boricua, meaning that um, I totally uh, adjust my. Um, we're from the diaspora. My father is from that. Um, his family was from Loisa, Puerto Rico. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Lauren Jacobs, could you share with our viewers today uh, where you're from and your ministry context? Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Obviously, judging from my accent, I'm not in the USA. Uh, I actually am in Cape Town, South Africa today, which is where I live. Uh, my family have been here. My mom and dad's family have been here for a total of 350 years. Uh, so that's a very, very long time. And uh, my dad's family are actually Jewish. And my mom's family are actually Anglican Christians. So very mixed bag of things. But yes, uh, about me, well, I started my professional career out about 12 years ago as a social justice journalist, traveling around and writing on issues that I had seen women and young girls, you know, going through and situations that I really felt God laid on my heart. I needed to create awareness about and speak up about. So that was what I did at the same time. I was a trauma psychologist and studied psychology and all of that and got advanced degrees and then became interested in how we are doing things like gender regarding theology, you know, being an egalitarian, I do believe in the equality of all people, regardless of race or gender. And so when we look at the Bible, we see that. So I went on to do my master's in divinity and am also a PhD candidate, um, but have decided to go and do my honors in ancient Near Eastern studies. So I write a lot about, you know, the context of the Bible, been teaching the Bible for 12 years as a theologian, 
have a radio show, write a lot of books, and just really, really advocate a lot for woman abuse and, of course, healing for women and men in the Christian church who have both been subjected to abuse, sexual violence, and that kind of thing. Because although today's conversation is going to be about women, it's very important. We know that our men are also being abused and also experience that. So it's a bit of both. So that's my kind of context. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lauren. I'm so grateful for that. And I look forward to unpacking that more uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, Dr. Bethany Haley Williams, how are you, sister? Why don't you share with us a little bit more about yourself? Make sure you take yourself. There you go. Right. Yeah. So I'm just so excited to be here. I'm really honored to be asked to be a part of this panel. And Honestly, looking forward to learning from all of these ladies. Um, I'm just so thrilled to, to hear about your backgrounds and, and what um, really where the Lord has led you to. So, um, so a little bit about me. In terms of education, um, I have an LCSW, which is a licensed clinical uh, social work. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and then my PhD is in counseling psychology. So um, that's my education background um, and was in private practice for several years and then 13 years ago founded an organization called Exile International and we work in the countries of Congo and Uganda, uh, work with rescue child soldiers and children who've been orphaned by the war. Um, our focus is art focused trauma care as well as holistic rehabilitation and uh, the dream is that we see child survivors of war becoming leaders for peace in their communities and really changing the trajectory of war um, by helping them to heal from their wounds of trauma, but also teaching peace building skills and leadership skills, um, providing education and food and clothing. Um, so that's my background. Um, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here and excited to learn more from everyone. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you're such a blessing uh, to me personally, and it's just an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, it's Yopiam Dabale. Why don't you come off mute and just introduce yourself and share uh, with our guests? Yeah, greetings all. Uh, my name is Yopiam Dabale. I'm originally from Nigeria, to be precise, Northern Nigeria. I came to the US over a decade ago. Um, going to school as an international student. So I went, I have a master's in divinity from Duke University, um, master's of theology from Boston College. I'm currently a PhD candidate at Fuller in Pasadena. And um, I do not necessarily see myself as a pastor or minister, but I do work that reflects that. So I have over eight, so thus far actually about 18 years of doing work here in the United States, helping uh, marginalized groups, precisely African Americans, and helping in in everyday life. Um, I also volunteer, donate money, just you name it. Um, my research, though, my research is uh, situated in northern Nigeria about women's identity and how they function in the church and also among their ethnic group. And I also link it because as a Pan Africanist, I look at things Black experience globally, so I link it with. Ethiopia. So I'm looking at ancient African women in their early Christian phases. Um, I'm also the member of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians, and we do a lot of work about women. We write a lot. Many, some people in the West do not know about us, but we do a lot of work, groundwork, and also interact with people from African traditional religion, from Islam, and we write and we adv advocate for women. So this is a place for me to be, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. It's powerful, and we so need your voice uh, in this discussion. Ms. Gina Thomas. Hey, sis, come on Hello. and share with us. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's such a wonderful honor to be here. My name is Gina Thomas. I am a former missionary to Mexico, where my son was born. Um, and have another have a daughter since then we've been back in the states for quite a while now i work at an organization called wine to water which is a um, water access and wash uh, nonprofit that works internationally and i am also an author of two books uh, smoldering wick which is about merging development principles with missions work and uh, most recently separated by the border which 
is the story of my former foster daughter who was separated from her mother um, on her journey up from Central America to the U.S. border. Um, and so I am just really happy to be a part of this panel and learn as much as everyone else. So thank you. Oh, that's so exciting. Like I see somebody just commenting. They are sending greetings from Mexico City. So just so grateful. <laughs> that's just so awesome. And last but not least, Ms. Kayon Watson, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Morning, afternoon, night, depending where you're calling or signing in from. Um, I'm so excited as well to be here. I'm very, I just have, I'm honored to be here, just to be in the, the virtual room with all of you ladies. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Kayon Watson. I'm first generation American with a very rich Jamaican heritage. So I'll be considered Afro Caribbean. Um, born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, and I believe that my upbringing of being exposed at such a young age um, internationally, just from my just third culture lifestyles growing up, um, that I always had a heart for the nation's people and culture with Christ. And so for I've served in ministry and in international ministry uh, in, about, in about 20 countries um, in the areas of, tra of trauma-informed art making, um, servicing um, human trafficking survivors through social business, and then also now I'm currently a missionary with an organization called SEN56, where we train native Africans to reach unreached people groups in their um, countries. And so I'm really excited to be launching out to Kenya uh, later this year uh, with my soon to be husband and really serving um, the African missions movement. Uh, in addition to that, while I'm here stateside, I uh, work for an international nonprofit called Oxfam and I also am the chairwoman of a international organization, an organization called Builderbridge, where we use trauma-informed art therapy to bring hope and healing to those living in difficult situations around the world. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm so excited. There's just such a cohesiveness across the board at this panel. And as I've shared with all of you attendees, uh, you see the wealth of wisdom that's here. And so that is just a precursor for the conversation that we're about to have. I want you all to know that you can feel free to share your greetings as you've been doing. Tell us where you're from, what missions organization you're with, what ministry you're part of. Uh, share that with us. We are a family here in this discussion. Uh, for questions, though, we would ask that you would leave those in the Q&A section uh, so that we can address those when we get to that portion of the dialogue. So we're so excited about that. And as some of our panelists have just shared, they are authors, they've written about their work uh, in their books and I own those books, they've been a blessing to me. And so those resources will be shared today, even following our panel discussion. And so we just wanna tap into God's heart and successfully join him in what he's doing in the world for his precious daughters globally. So this is Shades of Sisterhood. To start, what we want to do for a conversation so huge, I mean, we couldn't possibly cover the myriad of issues that face women around the world, but we want to show you a video uh, that will help give context to our discussion today. naona maisha ni magumu kwangu tu sana ni sana ni sana sababu nilikuwa naletafutiaka mie peke yangu leo na kwa mkutafutiwa na watoto naona kama ni vigumu sana jina langu naitwa Elizabeth Bukado mimi naishi hapa ukanda na kivali na nilitokea Kongo masisi Shida nilipo pata Kongo. Mimi nilikuwa, mu, nilikuwa natumika mu asosiasyo inaita Amukave. Ilikuwa asosiasyo na seria wa mama winyo wana pito mubakaji. Alafu ikawa siku moja, na lamuka asubui, nikaona mama anakuwa kunita. Anase mama, kuna mtoto moja analala kule kubarabara, iko nalia sana, tujue ni shida kani anapata. Hapo nikaenda haraka nikakuta mtoto ni shida ya ubakaji. Nikakamata mtoto nikakimbizia kwa hospitali. Tukabakia mu research na tukabapata, tukapata umoja 
na katabi nje kibote batatu baadaye tukienda kwenye polisi iko akakuya kubakamata sasa tukaruti yetu kunyumba tunayo kama tulisha maliza kazi yote bali wanaenda kuba 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 fonshi tunabaki yetu kunyumba baadaye ya miezi mbili mimi niko kushamba kutafutia batoto chakula ya kubaweka mnyumba nikaona banatokea batatu banduki yake na bale binye tulifungishaka bakanambia hivi mama Elizabeth wewe ndio nasemeaka binye banabakiwa sasa na wewe ujiokoe maisha yako inaisha saa hii na kuanza kunikata na mipanga bakapika mpanga hapa na njoo ikafika tena hapa bakapika mipanga hapa bilole bikakatika bakapika mpanga hapa mkono ikakatika sasa mkula mkulalamika ngufu njo ule mtu ulikuwa chini ya shamba yangu jirani wa shamba akakuja akakuya na lalamika sema eh hey, bana wa mama Elizabeth Jo bale baba bana bakakimbia bakaenda. Kisi bali tosha kapale misi njue. Mai kichwa mnayala mipanga. historia yangu somo la kenda ninatuambia hivi namna gani naweza kasamia huyu aliyekukosea somo la nane somo la nane ninasema <laughs> yapeleke maumivu yetu yote chini ya msalaba wa Bwana Yesu. Somo la 4 linasema namna kan tunaweza kusaidia watoto walio kumbana na mambo mabaya. Somo la 10 linasema namna kan tunaweza kuishi katika mafarakana tuko wa Kristo. Ile mafundisho inisaidia sana nikapata na roho ya kusema nisamee wale walinikata na mipanga. Lakini wakati nilipoingia ndani ya masomo hii nikaisoma yenye Bible to today nikasikia inanijenga ndani mwangu Sasa yenye inaingia moto furaha na sio kama na furaha ina nini na shukuru na Biblia societe kutuletea masomo ya kuponesha vidonda vya mwili na vya roho Mungu awabariki sana na Mungu awasirishie such a, a moving, uh, compelling video uh, that we pray uh, you all were moved by as well. And why we wanted to share this is because every woman has a story. Some never get to tell that story. For instance, mine came from a, a broken, blended, but restored family. And that led to a search for identity and experiencing years away from my own birth mother, but that birthed a purpose to see other women become all God intended them to be. From there, the call to global missions led me to women globally and another world opened up with issues far beyond my own. So where historical and cultural traditions and stigmas have distorted 
the role and the value of women. We wanna see this from a pure theological and missiological lens. That's why we want to have this discussion today. So from detention camps in China where women are being raped to brothels in Cambodia to femicide and gender-based violence in Nigeria, South Africa, in Sierra Leone, to refugee women in Syria, to period poverty and female genital mutilation in Kenya, to trafficking that's happening globally, to women migrants at the border. Global women's issues are a gospel priority. That's why we're bringing that to center today and we wanna to tackle that. So let's start to tackle this conversation and educate each other on what we need to do as women. So Dr. Rios, why don't you kick us off? We wanna talk about the plight of education. A lot of these things that hinder the progress of women around the world are rooted in the lack of education. The UN estimates that 11 million girls will potentially never return to school after the COVID-19 pandemic. So we just wanna ask you, are we seeing progress in women's access to education in countries where it traditionally is forbidden or ignored? And how do you think COVID-19 is impacting this progress? Well, you know, I would love to say yes to this question, but, you know, despite, you know, all the work that has been done and, and how we're connected globally, there's still a lot um, that needs to be done in developing countries for women to receive the schooling that they need. And they're still receiving less than men. <clears throat> and, uh, excuse me. And one of the things that we're noticing is that um, women are, are connected to their, um, because of their of poverty in their countries, <clears throat> excuse me, um, are, are, are and not getting the education that they need that contributes to the poverty that they experience. Um, the One World Organization, which um, has done a lot of research on women in education, they basically remind people that are interested in this uh, issue that in order for any of us to see meaningful progress when it comes to women and education and girls in school and learning, that we need to pay attention to the poorest countries and what they're experiencing and what, what kind of conflicts are being experienced in those countries. So I know a lot of my panelists um, uh, members have mentioned also that they are working already in Africa and nine out of the toughest uh, um, areas, countries are in Africa. Um, Guinea, Mali, Chad, um, <clears throat> um, Liberia, uh, Niger, uh, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, those are some of the major areas where uh, women are not seeing the progress that they sh should be seeing. And, and, and when we look at the statistics, it actually tells us too that there's no African country that's actually performing good when it comes to women in education. We have seen some progress, <clears throat> but not the progress that we should be seeing as we enter into 2021. Um, you know, 132 million girls are out of school, uh, 34.3 million of them are primary school age. And when it comes to COVID-19, um, it has dramatically impacted the, the, the education of young girls and their health and well-being. Because if they're not able to return to school, uh, a lot of other things end up happening to them. And they equate to uh, that to what had happened during like 2014, 2016, when the Ebola outbreak uh, happened that women and girls weren't allowed to go back to school. So they actually experienced more sexual violence, more exploitation. So that's exactly what uh, they're expecting to see now with this uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And also since they're not in school, uh, the other thing that, that is expected to happen is that we're gonna see more visibly pregnant girls, which girls in these areas are banned if they're pregnant. So even if they wanted to go back to school, they wouldn't be able to. Um, so COVID-19 has uh, increased the dropout rate for, for young girls. They either, you know, again, as I mentioned, they become victims of sexual violence, they become pregnant. And um, if it hasn't been something that they've been impacted with themselves, if someone in their home or caregiver, you know, parents or something like that has been impacted, that's another way that they end up not uh, having the education that they need because they have to drop out in order to contribute to uh, the home. 
So it keeps you know young women at home and um, it doesn't help them in this process of education. And unfortunately, um, it, it uh, contributes to the fact that as women are deprived of education and their families are deprived of that, then the societies in which they live continue to suffer and suffer mostly from poverty. So um, as we have maybe have um, gotten disinformation from various things that we've been involved in, when women are educated and, and they're adequately educated, everyone benefits. And unfortunately, in this situation right now, with the added um, uh, obstacle of COVID-19, we're, we're expecting to see um, much more violence than things that we were hoping we wouldn't be having to see now. Thank you so much. For that. And I just want to echo that. Um, that's just something that Kenya alone experienced a 40% increase in teenage pregnancy since the start of the pandemic. And some of those cases were of incest. Um, and so there's so many different just variables that are impacting these things. Um, and when you think about cultural implications and uh, for instance, the Sumbru tribe, which is a pastoral nomadic tribe, there are some girls who never enter school. And if they do, they're, they may be 14 years old in the second grade. Um, or entering into a, a forced marriage, which pulls them out of school. But I, I love the link uh, that you connected to education and the outcome of poverty uh, for young women who are not educated. Now, I wanna uh, throw this question to Kayon. Why is economic empowerment important for women? As we think about this whole educational context and why we need uh, women around the world to be educated. Thank you for asking. Um, it's actually so huge. So often, many times, money is seen as the source of power and really around the world. And oftentimes we know that women are more marginalized when it comes to decision-making, even though they carry the weight of caring for the whole family. Um, you will find women overseas more so getting the water, um, washing the clothes, doing the hard labor, where the man will be out working or maybe not working if there is work to do, but for sure the weight of the work is on the woman. And they often are not, there's no sort of compensation for that. They may not be the one selling the biggest cow or, or whatever that could be. And so if they have the opportunity to not only provide for, if they have the money, they will be providing for their children, for the home, for that husband. Um, studies can, are shown throughout many different statistics that when a woman has finances, the whole community is flourishing. So that is, it's so key. Um, it's also very countercultural um, in many contexts for the, the woman to make financial decisions. Um, but we've seen that there's so much blessing added on to that when the cases are turned. That's so good. I want to direct the same question to Gina. Would you add on to that? Why economic empowerment is so important, especially in the context in which you serve? Yeah, well, um, it, specifically within um, the story that that I share in my book, Separated by the Border, um, you know, economic empowerment was what this mother was seeking. And so um, my former foster daughter um, came to the U.S. alongside her biological mother. And thankfully, the two have been re reunited now. So I just want to get that out in the open because um, it's very exciting. Um, but they were separated for eight months. Um, and uh, the, the only reason um, that the migration happened to begin with was economic empowerment. Um, the biological mother from the time she was 13 uh, was responsible for her um, elder family members. And then of course, as she um, had her own children was responsible for them as well. And so because men kind of moved in and out of her life, including her father, um, that economic empowerment keeps families together. And I think that's something that we don't often talk about, that families belong together and part of them belonging together is making sure that they are empowered economically, um, you know, holistically um, in order to stay together. And so one of the things that I, I hope that people understand um, about why people migrate from Central America to the U.S. is really just that that factor right there is that this is not uh, an easy decision to make. This is not a, hey, let's go in search of the American dream. Um, most women know that uh, six out of 10 of them will be raped along the way um, or, or suffer some type of, of sexual violence. Um, they know this is a big risk. And 
if the only options laying in front of them is not finding a job um, or you know, being pushed out of this area because of the violence coming against me and my family, then the decision to, to move towards the border is one that's made um, for survival and for families staying together. And I think that's something that I really hope people will understand, which is why as Christians, we need to be involved in this. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just reminded of the challenges that come as a result of these challenges that face women in terms of uh, who are displaced or migrating when we don't have those economic opportunities available to us, uh, just the things that we are susceptible to. And you would think that when someone is in their most vulnerable state and sometimes fleeing persecution um, and things of that sort, that there will be greater compassion, but it also, it actually makes them more vulnerable uh, to being attacked, to being raped. And so I wanna talk about that and just segue right into uh, your area of expertise, Gina. Why don't you talk about some of the biggest misconceptions when we talk about migration, uh, sex trafficking, uh, the rape of women. What are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about migration and modern day slavery and its effect on women? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, I think one of the, as far as Christians are concerned, I think one of the biggest mis misconceptions that we have is that, um, you know, most uh, migrants coming from Central America are Christians. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and unfortunately, in America, um, a lot of the different groups of people that I talk to in reference to this book um, have this misconception that, oh, they're coming to steal our jobs or they're coming to take our land or, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so we have the scarcity mentality that says there's not enough. Um, and, and if we really look at the God of the Bible, right, we know that this is a God of abundance. There is always enough. There are gleaning laws set in place because there is enough. We need to be reminded that there is enough. Um, and I think um, in, in the case of, uh, of my friend Lupe, um, she came to the U.S. not intending to stay. Um, and I think that's another big misconception is that her home is Honduras. That's her home. That's her people. That's her culture. That's where she wants to be. Um, and there's a lot of push factors that are moving people from Central America into the U.S. Um, and, and across, you know, across the globe, the push and pull factors that create um, some of this. And I think one of the things we have to understand um, as Americans is that some of those pull factors are, are our own fault. Um, you know, we have we have given rise to some of these multinational uh, corporations that are, um, you know, allowing exploited labor to be the norm. And yes. When we do that kind of stuff, like we are at fault. Um, and so I really wish that we would come to understand a little bit more of our own, um, you know, our own shame and blame that we need to own and we need to repent from um, in, this, in this process. And then again, just this idea that, <clears throat> that um, the decision is easy to make. It's not an easy decision to make. And it's one that will continue to haunt her for the rest of her life. Um, the yeah. things that she has suffered, the things that her family has suffered because of it is a daunting ordeal. Um, and the trauma, as some of you uh, can speak to a lot better than I can, uh, is lifelong, both for her daughter, who was separated first from her by the smugglers that took her captive. And then because uh, the U.S. government then separated her daughter from the stepdad they were traveling with. So I think it's really important we understand this is not a nuanced thing. This is not black and white. We don't need to say, oh, they're being sinful or any kind of shame um, allocated towards that. Um, and I'll just mention this real quick. The border lines that we have created were created in sin. So let's just name that. Up right. Front. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That, that will absolutely preach. And I, I saw Yoke now shaking her head. I uh, would love for you to weigh in on this as well. Um, to kind of discuss this a little bit more and unpack it um, so that we can get more understanding. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I, I do think that it has a lot to do, for example, immigrants, this is even for African immigrants. Um, there's this understanding that all this perception that when you get here, we take jobs and all. And I often highlight the fact that um, many of us wouldn't wanna be in the United States. Nobody wants to leave home 
majority of us will want to stay home. Part of the problem is that our countries are not functioning the way they should be functioning. And part of the reason why it has a lot to do with Western imperialism. Mm -hmm. We have to highlight this even as Christians because Christians usually tend to talk about the spirituality and not mention specifically policies that are impacting people's lives. And mm -hmm. some of these policies has been sponsored by Christians, Christians support it. You vote for a person that, uh, that advocates, for example, for uh, war and US foreign wars usually is imposing US ideas. For example, I do not want to even highlight this, uh, go into details, but for example, there are, there are reports on US government, the current government trying to impose sexual laws on Nigeria, that if Nigeria does not apply to it, the U your US government is not gonna, uh, is gonna uh, decrease the amount of individuals that are gonna uh, interact with Nigeria and, and the United States. So we have to make this very clear that it's not just some, well, I would say by many immigrants, we didn't wanna be here. Nobody wants to be, leave home, but we're here because the US policies and, and other Western countries are terrorizing our countries. Hence the reason why we have war, for example, in, in Liberia, I lived in Liberia. I lived in Sierra Leone. So I know what US policy means, what the impact. So missionaries now want to go and, 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 and undo and undo the damage, but sometimes, you know, Americans, local Americans, Christians, Muslims tend to support policies that are harmful for the least of these globally. It creates problems. Amen. Wow, that's just so, so profoundly impactful to hear that and to hear your perspective. Um, and even as Gina noted, it's we're doing things uh, under the banner of Christianity that are actually antithetical to scripture in the heart of who Jesus Christ is. And so that needs to be acknowledged, repented, addressed in order for us to be able to move forward uh, to a place where we're actually fulfilling uh, the Great Commission as God intended for women. But I think that's a good place to segue into uh, the, the, the global challenges that women face when it comes to uh, our value in our bodies. Because even when we talk about these educational uh, challenges, we talk about uh, economic challenges, poverty, and all of these things, some of that is because of uh, the, the way we as women are seen globally and our value being diminished uh, because we've been viewed as property or less than or uh, as someone's uh, object of, of pleasure and that kind of objectification. So we wanna just talk more about that. And part of that is how women are abused. <laughs> And that's justified by different cultural rituals or religious beliefs. Um, and so Lauren, I would love for you to just come in so we can kind of unpack gender-based violence. I, I don't know if you all were following uh, last year, 2020 was a year uh, of just grief, lament, and, and, and challenges of epic proportions, particularly not just because of the pandemic, but because of what a lot of women faced around the world. Um, because of rape and being murdered. And I remember there was a one, one girl in South Africa who was uh, murdered by her boyfriend. She was pregnant and he hung her from a tree. Um, and, and, and it's just unimaginable the challenges that women go through. So could you talk about why we've experienced this global spike in acts of violence? Not that it's new, um, but last year, uh, it just was brought to the, the front even more so. And what can we do in terms of missionally informed action to respond to that? And you can just unpack some of that right now, but we wanna talk more about why these acts of violence are so prevalent against women. Mm. Thank you so much for that question. I think it's such a great one. And I, for me, it's uh, a big responsibility and to be speaking about this topic, especially because I'm coming to you from RSA, Republic of South Africa, alternatively known as the Republic of Sexual Abuse. You know, if you go and do a simple Google search, you will see that we are the rape capital of the world. We don't wear that badge with honor. We wear it with shame. 
And throughout this pandemic, our president has appeared on television a number of times and has said to us, we are fighting two pandemics. One is COVID-19, the other is gender-based violence in South Africa. We know, I'm gonna pack this in three phases, but we know that every three seconds, a woman is raped in South Africa. We know that every three hours, a woman is killed in South Africa. So by the time that you know we finish this panel, we would have had an hour and a half together say, every three seconds a woman is raped how many women have been raped in the short time that we had this discussion and uh actually kanita the the woman that you referenced that was pregnant and was hung on a tree eight months pregnant and killed and slaughtered by her boyfriend he just got 20 years in jail uh right this week he was sentenced but in south africa the way it works is your sentence you only carry half of that out in prison so he'll probably only be there for 10 years and he killed two lives but i really want to unpack this by telling the story not by telling you my perspective but by telling you a story like you said 2020 was i would say a year where we saw this global reality happening where we were seeing so much about gender-based violence and i'm going to talk about that a little bit on but you know what um 2019 was a year for south african women and i paint this context you know, a young girl of 19 years old, a university student, her name was Uyaneni. She woke up that morning and she had a slip, you know, from the post office. She had a package waiting for her. She walked down to the post office a mere 20 kilometers. I don't know how many miles that is, but 20 kilometers from my house where I live in a good suburban area, suburbia, as we call it, a good area. She walked to the post office. A government middle-aged employee, male, was standing there and said to her, no, our system is offline. Come back later and uh, I can give you your package later. And this was August 2019 and she was unsuspecting and returned later, only to find herself in a situation where the post office was deserted this post office clerk pulled her inside, brutally raped her and bludgeoned her continually. In court, he handed himself in um, and in court he said, she, and I wanna quote, she was hard to kill, hard to die. She was really strong, that one. I eventually dropped a big scale from the post office on her head. It was the only way I could get rid of her. A 19 year old and every single day in August, 2019, which is Women's Month in South Africa, and we celebrate Women's Day on the 8th of August, on the 9th of August. You know, every single day in August 2019, we lost a woman. Every single day, we woke up consistently to the news that another girl had been dismembered. Little girls had been found raped and stashed in drain pipes. The reason I'm saying this so openly is because this is how we live. And the, the, to say this very respectfully, you know, Uya Neni's death has been very closely referenced as our George Floyd moment, because what happened was thousands of women took to the streets in South Africa. We stopped the World Economic Forum. It was happening in Cape Town where I live. We stopped it. The president came out. He addressed us. He went on TV. He introduced three new bills to parliament. You know, our government still sitting trying to pass those bills. And we are living in a situation in South Africa where this is our reality. This is our norm. And I remember that September, my friends and I talking to one another and finally saying to one, to one another, are you afraid of being raped? You know, we'd never had that conversation before. We'd never said to one another, is that a fear that you carry? And the answer was yes. You know, all of us live in a consistent, continual fear that this is our reality. And again, a lot of people have said, well, why don't you leave? No one wants to leave their home. It's exactly like all my sisters are saying, no one wants to just leave their home. Our families are here, our heritage is here, this is our lives. So we're not gonna leave, we're gonna try and change something. But I wanna end off this tiny section saying something that really impacted me was a lot of people turned to me in 2019 while we were losing woman after woman after woman while yeah. thousands of us were taken to the street while thousands of us were crying while thousands of us were broken a lot of people said to me lauren where is the church mm. and in that time the church was so so silent that it was a deafening silence that was hard to hear 
and the church you know needs to step up which we'll talk about a bit later but think about that for a moment people were desperate for the church to have an answer to the heartbreak that they were experiencing who's going to hold space for us and the church at that stage let us down so now we need to think about that and what does that really mean to protect that dignity and that value and that honor not only here but globally around the world yes absolutely and we're commanded in the word of God to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves that we might be a voice uh, for the voiceless. And so we can't abdicate our witness in our role as disciples and those who should be the conduits of justice and compassion uh, to respond to these needs. And I remember those events and you and I were talking uh, through these events as, as our hearts just grieved uh, for what our sisters around the world uh, have been going through. Bethany, I would love for you just to kind of speak to women being used as weapons of war, especially given that you serve in the Congo. And uh, that was an, a phenomenon that I had to learn so much more about. And I, I couldn't really wrap my mind around it because it's just so heinous and demonic, um, similar to what Lauren just described. Um, would you talk a little bit more about that? And, and as the ladies are speaking, um, attendees, please continue to share your comments and, and questions uh, that you might have around these issues. I know it's a lot uh, in one session that we're covering, but please feel free to share those um, so that you can continue to be educated even beyond. We want this conversation to live beyond uh, this event. So Bethany, could you just talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that, I don't know if, um, how educated those who are tuning in know about the prevalence of um, rape being used as a weapon of war in Congo. Um, it's truly an epidemic and um, it really goes back to fear and control. So a lot of both the rebel militia and also uh, the government forces at times will use rape as a weapon of war um, to send a message that we are in control. Um, we do have power here. And as all of, all of the sisters here have, have spoken to, um, women have power in their communities and they are um, often the ones in the home that bear the weight of um, caring, being caregivers, being the ones who fetch water, being the ones who take in the orphan children around the village. Um, you know, no one else will take them in. And so if you can traumatize a woman, then you are traumatizing the village and you are traumatizing a community. Um, and so, you know, I think what's so important in these situations um, is to go to the root. Like, why is this happening? And how can we be a part of stopping it? And when I think of why it's happening, I think of um, the, the men who raped that little girl in the video and the men who attacked, I think it was Mama Elizabeth maybe. And why did they do that? Um, and what mentors did they have in their lives or, or what message was sent to them? What trauma did they experience to lead to that event? And um, I think it's important to really think through culturally what messages are sent and then trying to differentiate between kingdom culture um, and our culture. And so when I say our culture, I'm not just talking about an African culture or a Congo culture or culture in Uganda, I'm talking about the Western culture as well. Yeah. Um, really looking at what messages are being sent in our culture, telling us that certain things are acceptable and they're okay, or they're not that big of a deal. And so we shouldn't make it that big of a deal. Um, and filtering that through scripture and filtering that through what kingdom culture says. And so kingdom culture says, love your neighbor as yourself and honor one another. And so um, when you think about that, it's really convicting to us as Westerners, as well as maybe those who are in different cultures who have always thought, okay, well, this is okay to do, or this is acceptable to do. We have, you know, I've heard stories in our work in Congo and Uganda, pastors abusing their wives and yeah. they preach 
next Sunday because it's acceptable and it's, it's okay to do because everybody really does it, but it's not okay to do if you filter your culture through scripture and what Jesus teaches us to do. And so really in the work that, that we do working with war affected kids, we try to, to get to, okay, what's the root and how can we teach these kids a different way to, to look at life? How can we even teach the young ladies how to honor themselves um, many of the young girls we work with have been sex slaves whenever they were um, captured. And so yeah. the view that they look at themselves is through the lens of their culture. So I'll never get married again. I'll never be married. Or um, if they are married and have a family and they've been raped, then often the husband will leave. And so then they look at themselves through that lens. So how can we teach them to look at themselves through the eyes of Jesus and through the lens of Jesus and through the lens of kingdom culture and teach the young men a different way um, of honoring women as much as they would honor themselves because that's what scripture really teaches us to do. Um, right. I'll stop there. Absolutely. That was so, so good. I think, and, and I think that was in a, somebody mentioned that or alluded to that in the, in the chat section as well. So much of this is rooted in a, a toxic faith where the infallible word of God or the expression of that is distorted because of cultural worldview, because of self agenda, because of carnality and sin. And the Bible is used as a weapon to further harm uh, the vulnerable, um, which is unthinkable. Uh, but we want to begin to move towards a place where we are in our missional you know, our missionally informed action, dismantling that and beginning to be, you know, those who bring true healing based on the sound teaching of scripture while also helping, which is why I love trauma healing so much because it doesn't separate or compartmentalize the believer from their emotions and their trauma that they've experienced. If you're gonna have sound doctrine, you need to be spiritually healthy as well because they, they work together. Um, and so, when we talk about this, you know, unspeakable violence against women, uh, one of the uh, main acts that's happening right now is female genital mutilation. Um, and that's something that also impacts the girls that we serve, uh, the, the, the incest, the rape uh, that happened. We had a case where uh, one of our girls, and we're getting ready to institute uh, trauma healing in our ministry now, which we're so excited about, uh, she was being uh, raped by her father who is a pastor um, and she referred to that as I'm being used as his wife. How do I forgive him? How do I move past this? Um, and that culture of secrecy because she held on to that for years. Um, and so let's talk more about that. Yoknam, can you talk about what female genital mutilation is? Um, some people still don't know what it is and, and, and why it's happening. And in addition to some of these other issues, pregnancy, why are there um, barriers that still remain in place that keeps this uh, horrendous practice alive? Yeah, thank you. So female genital mutilation as it's called, others call it female circumcision, actually. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a surgery that uh, parents, especially mothers um, have done on their daughters and this is done actually globally not just on the on, on the African continent right. and um, there's about over 30 countries in Africa that practice this um, and within those countries though I have to make this clear not every ethnic group does this um, I come right. from Nigeria it has been practiced in Nigeria among the uh, in the eastern part of Nigeria among the Igbo people while I'm from the north I'm from the Yotibali group we do not practice female genital. I call it, I, I, I prefer using the term circumcision because it's very offensive for those that are pro this practice. Um, so I use female circumcision and I also actually make it make the connection for people who may not understand how this works. If it's, it's a surgery, then the point of this surgery is to help the, the, the girl because usually it's done on girls. And the point is to move you to womanhood, okay? And parents do that, and some argue that it has to do with uh, pleasure, so so that you enjoy sex when you are you become a woman. The other part of it is to tame you, 
until you become a woman, meaning taming me, you are so you don't become promiscuous. So that's why this is all done. Um, others argue that um, that it's 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 oppression. That's that those are the, those are the views. But then there are groups that believe that this practice is the reason why it continues. For example, in Sierra Leone, I lived in Sierra Leone. By the way, Dr. Bethany mentioned about. Uh, war. I've been in this the war in Sierra Leone. So I lived in Sierra Leone for very long, for about close to five years. So I was not just living there. I was part of the culture. I speak the language as I speak Creole. I did speak Creole. And so uh, with all of that in Sierra Leone, they also practice among uh, the ethnic group that I, uh, the Mende people. Uh, by the way, I use the word ethnic because tribe is racist. Race, tribe has racist undertone and even the, the term native. I would encourage missionaries to stop using that. There are several literature on this native tribe. It, it's, it's extremely racist. Uh, so I use ethnic. I mean, some Africans use the word tribe because our education is very colonial and we're trying to deconstruct. But um, so I just wanted to make that footnote. But part of the reason why all this is done, um, so female circumcision is done is to to, you know, I, I, I laid out different reasons why people do it. And there are groups now, I know of an organization in Sierra Leone, and it's also part of the group is based here in the United States. They are advocating for female circumcision. They believe that it's their right to do this to their bodies. And some of them are very educated women. I know the, the leader of this organization, it's uh, Dr. Amadou. And, they, they, they believe that they have the right to do this to the body. And the part of the argument is that in the United States, for example, there is, um, there is a, a, a rise in plastic surgery. Women mm. do plastic surgery. For example, mm. among the state African-American women do butt, you know, implants. Oh, yeah. there mm. you go. Oh, breast, and, and then some also not only, uh, and then for among white women, you do vaginal plasia, that is to, um, after a woman had children, you know, her, her, her private part has become, um, to not go into detail, after childbearing, you know, you don't like the way your, your private part is, you go and have this plastic surgery, or you want to make it quote unquote look pretty. So all these surgery of some women, you know, they, they, you know, the older you get, you go and have surgery. They're arguing that they want to look younger. So some of, some of the critics of, 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 um, of Western missionaries or Western advocates that are saying that African women should not be having this um, done to their children. They're saying that, look at you, you're destroying mm -hmm. your body. Your mm -hmm. body is a temple of God. You're destroying mm -hmm. with plastic surgery, yet mm -hmm. you have the audacity to tell African women what to do with their bodies. So mm -hmm. those are the, um, those are the, the, these are the conversations surrounding this topic. Uh, and um, we cannot, however, um, say that there, there are also variation to this uh, surgery. There are variation to some are very harmful. Hence, those are the ones that you probably have seen images of young girls, you know, getting killed because it was not done properly. Um, but there are others also, they, it depends how the surgery is done, whether it's removed part of your, your clitoris is removed completely, while others, they just cut part of it. So they are dynamic, they are layers to this. It's not one, uh, there's no one expl explanation to it, but it's important for us to know the general overview. And then in terms of, to, to not take off all of our time, in terms of teenage pregnancy, uh, some of them have been already highlighted by the other ladies on this panel. Uh, I've been following also because I'm part of a community of the Circle of Concerned African Women Theologians and also World Council of Churches had panels for over a week where women come and share. These are scholars, African women scholars, and people that are also on ground doing the work. They had some of the panels, they discussed how COVID-19 affected um, young people. And some, you know, young girls exact get raped because you're now in close proximity with other family members. And then you can't go out because you know of the restrictions. And then poverty is part of it. Yeah. And then also, and then also among other ethnic groups, for example, in my ethnic group, actually, in terms of teenage pregnancy, you do get shown if you get pregnant, because the, the whole point is we want to preserve you to get married, uh, which the, the, the idea of preserving is, is problematic in this point, but, you know, they want to preserve you to get married. The others too, in terms of rape, actually, in my context, you get killed traditionally. 
So when we speak of African culture, we also have to contextualize because in, within my context, if you rape a girl, you will get killed. So traditionally that is, but now with Christianity and the so-called modernization, um, that is not being done. So some men who enjoy raping, they are not being punished as they should. Yeah, yeah. So heavy, um, so, so powerful. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is as we have heard about all of these uh, very pressing issues that we're facing, and some of us are facing in different uh, missional contexts, uh, looking for answers on how to better serve women's needs. Uh, we wanna start talking about some of the solutions. And I see some really, really great questions in the Q&A section. One of the things I wanna do though, because we're just after the, the lunch hour, if you're on the East Coast. Um, and so we've been here for about an hour and we're, we're gonna take the full time today because there's a lot to just unpack. And we really want you to leave this conversation with takeaways that you can implement in how you live, how you do your mission, how you respond as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, but we want to invite all of you to the National African American Missions conference this year. If you've ever been to this conference, you know uh, how transformational it is, how you leave with the necessary equipping uh, that you need in order to effectively mobilize toward the Great Commission. And so there's a special offer uh, that's in front of you right now that you can take advantage of if you register. Uh, the price has been reduced to $24.99 to attend uh, virtually. Let me tell you, the NAMAC conference has literally changed my life. I was honored to be a recipient of the Betsy Stockton Mission Award um, to go and serve our girls in Kenya. But even beyond that, the, the, the learnings uh, that I took were helpful in going back to my church to further build missional culture. So we want you all to join, share with your churches, share with uh, your networks, uh, this year's theme is boldly proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And so you want to be there. We want to just share that with all of you. For more information, just check the chat section. Uh, we're going to put the information there if you want to register for that. Um, but thank you so much, Yokian, for just unpacking that for us. Um, you know, we, we, we're, we're discussing it in a dialogue, in conversation. But when you really put yourself in the shoes of one of these young women experiencing uh, these um, acts that impact their self-image, impact how they understand themselves, or if they even can understand themselves of being an image bearer of God, um, how can we begin to move in a direction that we are reversing the damage that even we who profess Christ have inflicted upon different nations and cultures um, as to not benefit them and as to not equip them themselves to be disciple makers. Um, and so let's talk more about that, um, some solutions. One, I wanna just kind of touch on these, the trauma. I mean, these are young women who are living in a constant state of traumatic experiences. Um, I have a testimony of one of our girls. Uh, we we, we uh, did a call to salvation. They came to receive prayer and, and some of our girls literally collapse under the weight of their trauma. And you can just hear them screaming at the top of their lungs for help, uh, you know, for wholeness and healing. So uh, Bethany, can we just talk about that? And then I'm gonna unpack some things about women in leadership, Dr. Rios, that you'll touch on after this, but can we talk about how can women get to a place where they're healing uh, from the trauma that they've experienced? Yeah, I think this is such an important question because trauma affects really every part of our life. So we have had kids who have not been able to graduate school because they, can't concentrate whenever they go to school every day because their trauma is so severe. Um, it affects your relationships, um, ability to have healthy relationships, your relationship with God, your spiritual relationship, your bodies. Um, the mm. statistics about how trauma affects our physical bodies, it's, um, it's outstanding. And so I think, um, I think this is a call to the church is, um, 
to, to make sure or really prioritize that either your church, if you're working with a church here or you're working with a church internationally, that they have a trauma healing ministry. Um, because that oftentimes is really um, the key to so many of uh, women and men and boys and girls, um, their relationship to Christ and their relationship to Jesus, because our brains will literally shut down because we have, um, you know, if our degree of trauma is at, at a higher level. Um, so I think, I think um, trauma healing ministries groups, I think are really, really important, um, especially for women to have a safe place with other women who have gone through trauma, very similar to the, to the trauma that they have experienced. Um, the, the video that you, sh that we watched earlier um, was from the Trauma Healing Institute and American Bible Society. And I would encourage everyone, if you haven't, um, if you're not aware of the Trauma Healing Ministry of uh, American Bible Society or the Trauma Healing Institute, I would really encourage you to go and check that out. Um, there are, you know, different curricula in, in different languages being used around the world. It's been proven to help both adults and children. Um, and I'm happy to follow up with any questions personally on that as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And we love to have the Trauma Healing Institute website shared uh, in the chat section uh, for those who may be interested. It is life changing. It's been contextualized, used across over, I think, at least 140 countries. Um, and it's used for uh, people living in war torn regions and people in prisons in, in the United States. Um, and so it's been very effective um, in, in different contexts for which people are experiencing trauma. Um, so thank you so much for sharing more about that. And one of the things that we, you know, don't talk about all the time when we talk about issues of women is how men uh, play a role in that and how, you know, Satan's attempt to bring division between the roles of men and women. He's been so successful in that that there's a continual disconnect in how we minister to women and equip men to understand women. Uh, and I, I'm not a married woman, but I've heard some married women say, you know, some men don't even understand things about, you know, who we are, our bodies, they just don't know. We gotta tell them, we gotta share, you know? And so let, let's talk about that. Um, that really interesting component. One, Bethany, I just want you to tag on real quick and just maybe talk about you know, when we're addressing the needs of women, how can young men be empowered? Um, and then, like I said, Dr. Reels, we're going to ask about how that looks in the church context and how women are given the power uh, or the ability to, to lead. So could you share some about that, uh, Bethany? How can we help young boys and men understand women better? Yeah. Um, you know, when I think about this question, I think about mentorship and I think about the power of that, the power both negatively and positively, like think about, you know, we all have heard we are um, the five people that we spend the most time with, right? And so uh, think for a minute that you're a young man, a young boy, and you have five powerful mentors in your life who break down toxic masculinity, who speak truth in terms of honoring women, um, and listening to women, not just, on, not just honoring them at, at this level, but, but making sure they have a seat at the table because you're honoring and appreciating and valuing their voice and learning from them. Um, and then think about, imagine there are five mentors who promote and um, really are examples of toxic masculinity. And so, and so kind of play that out with these two uh, lifelines and, and, and these young men, what, what is this lifeline going to look like? What is this lifeline going to, going to look like? And so, yeah. um, I think the power of making sure that our older men are, um, educated very well and that there's some type of mentorship, maybe even program, um, or just a commitment of older men to mentor a younger man or a boy, um, fathers, um, you know, how do you view women? Ask yourself, um, do you honor, do you respect, do you elevate? 
Um, and those are hard questions, you know, yeah. really across across the globe. Those are hard questions. And um, so 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 I would say that's kind of a starting place is um, Christian mentorship. That's good. That's so good. And, and Dr. Rios, could you talk a little bit what, about what that looks like when we're in the church context? Uh, are, are, are women's voices empowered uh, by men in churches? What does that look like? And how can, that, how can we better foster equality? Do you see that there's inequality between uh, men and women? That you're asking me this because I feel like we just, we went back to where we all started, right? Yeah. Education, you know, um, I think in the church, uh, you know, the only way to really combat a lot of the things that we're seeing, that we're actually seeing kind of unfold right before our eyes in, in social media and on television and things like that is education in the church. And, you know, we have to realize that both, you know, religious leaders and even secular leaders, you know, they have to look, if you're working as a, as a person of faith in the secular world, you have to look at how your religious beliefs, uh, you know, the things that you have been taught um, affect how your worldview and how you treat people because people have used the Bible as has been mentioned many times here already as, as you know, a, a, a weapon uh, to, to, as a roadblock to keep people from things or to open up the pathways to people for things. Yeah. So I think education is the, 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 the main thing for everyone, everyone listening on this call, and, and for anyone that even asks us a question, like do the work, get involved and do the work. You know, it's gonna be uncomfortable. Yes, there's gonna be things that you don't agree with um, and um, that's going to rattle you and shake you at your very core because that is all you've ever known. But you have to understand that, you know, we have been given a colonized version of the gospel. And because of that, we have to go through the process of, of learning how that impacted, you know, um, uh, the way we, we see, you know, people through, uh, you know, as, as, you know, through racism and sexism, you know, I, I remember hearing one time that where you see sexism, you're going to see racism not far behind. And where you see racism, you're not going to see sexism far behind. And again, that all goes back to this Lord theology that, that we were given and we, we never questioned. So if, when we go through the process of education um, and there's various organizations that I can definitely provide links for. I, I did already one in the chat, um, but um, you know, as you do that, you're gonna go through a process of deconstructing, but we don't want people to stay there because deconstructing and not having any place to go and to uh, uh, work uh, to re uh, reconstruct is dangerous too. So you know, as, as you start to learn and you start to deconstruct from, from again, this colonized version of the gospel, then you start to see how that's impacted, um, you know, women and, and, and people of color. And then you start to see how that has helped people um, see them as people that can be, um, you know, victimized in various different ways. So to Thank me, you. it go, all goes back to education. So I started with education and I'm gonna end on education. Yes, yes, that's awesome. And so excellent, helps to inform us. Um, in strategic ways and where we can respond uh, to these issues. I think one of the questions that I would like to have us focus on right now as we talk about solutions is how can the church, because we, we've heard this over and over, this constant theme of the church has been silent. We need the church, we need the church um, to be the church who we've been called to be um, so that we can spread the gospel until all have heard and experienced and felt it um, how can we, as the church, effectively advocate for the injustices against women? I think in some instances, uh, there may be some who may feel uh, powerless at a loss of, of, of what they can do or afraid of what it would mean to be the voice, <laughs> to, to speak out against these injustices. Um, and so I would love for Lauren, if you could just touch on that as, and, and kind of tie that into uh, gender-based violence and how we can respond with missionally informed action. And then Gina, if you could just follow her and uh, talking about how we can face those injustices. 
Hmm. I think that for me, it's exactly like Dr. Rio said, it's got to do with training. And so I think in order for us and education, in order for us to know what's happening, we need to be correctly trained. And I want to, I'm going to take it a little step further and um, say that missionaries, elders, leaders, faith pastors, lay preachers, doesn't matter who you are. We need to, in our congregations, in our missionary councils and our missionary organizations, we have to actually have, when it comes to gender-based violence, we actually have to be trained. Our churches need to have effective training that's taking place, you know, so that we know how to deal with these things. So that when missionaries go onto the mission field, you come, you know, from the US to South Africa, be trained so that when you're meeting people, a woman, and in our context, you know, and you're, you want to understand abuse, how to deal with it, how to work with us. You know, the church, my master's degree was written on, you know, what is the church doing for abused women? And unfortunately, the church has always been a place of secondary victimization. I say that as just a stereotype, but it's, it's not all churches, and I'm, I must honor the churches that are doing amazing work. You know what, COVID-19, which is something you asked me about earlier on, last 2020 saw a huge bomb just go off here in South Africa of churches responding. 2019, they were silent. 2020, they started responding. I was on so many panels last year where people were coming together, speaking about this. There's things happening, and I'm very proud of what's happening here. But we need to all over the world be trained to understand gender-based violence. And then also we need to look at our personal theology. You know, there are theological realities that we believe that encourage gender-based violence. You know, when we looked at COVID-19 in 2020, the increase in gender-based violence, we saw and lean in by Sheryl Sandenberg released this amazing statistic that said 70% of the work during lockdowns in the United States were being done by women. Women were doing the cooking, the cleaning, the homeschooling, working from home, whereas men didn't think that was their role. So they didn't get involved with homeschooling or cooking or washing the clothes or doing what needed to be done. And yet in December, we see that almost 100% of the people affected economically in the United States with regards to COVID-19 were women losing their jobs and being at a loss. So I think that what we need to realize is unpack our own personal theology when it comes to gender roles, when it comes to patriarchy. I'm going to even take it a step further. I'm a scholar in ancient Near Eastern studies. Ancient Near Eastern studies is, you know, understanding what we would call the world around the Bible. So it goes back to, you know, the Philistines, the Hittites, the Nubians, you know, the Egyptians, the ancient Israelites. The people that were living four to six thousand years ago and i will tell you something we talk a lot about colonization and i get that but i want to tell you something because i'm writing my my masters and honors program in prisoners of war female prisoners of war in the ancient near east there was no female word for prisoners of war six thousand years ago years ago four thousand years ago because the abuse of women throughout our generations that patriarchal mindset mm -hmm. has has always been there. It didn't just come, you know, when there was things happening. It's always been there. So we need to revert to the Garden of Eden. We need to unpack our theologies and we need to kind of look at it and we need to get properly trained and we need to just speak up and be a voice. It's awesome, awesome. Gina, can you just uh, piggyback on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just want to want to jump in and yeah, just absolutely lift up what she just said. Um, I had a lot of the same thoughts myself. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things as for those who are listening to this webinar, um, I'm, I'm a white woman. Um, I think it's really important for me at, at a specific moment in time for people to look at my bookshelf and say, who are you reading? How are you being educated? Um, because it's not just education, it's how we are being educated. And when all that I ever read is white male theologians, then what I am going to do is use what has been given to me and give it out to others. And so it, it really requires um, a, a serious reflection, self-awareness, an understanding of what is going into my mind and who is it coming in through, right? And to stop looking at this, you know, this like 
Gnosticistic way of seeing Christianity where our bodies are not connected to our souls because Lord made us full and whole and human and for a reason and we celebrate that and we don't look away from that. So I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, as, as a female author, please read women, <laughs> um, pastors, you know, it's amazing how many times, even my husband, I ask him, what are you reading right now? It's amazing how many of my male friends rarely read female authors. And I think that needs to change. And I think, again, some of that like unconscious stuff that just is part of what we have understood as education needs to change. Um, and I think really it's, um, this, this idea of, okay, well, we're talking about African culture. We're talking about Central American culture. Well, let's talk about white culture too. Like, let's not forget that we need to reflect on what we are doing and what we have been doing. And, and the reason that we're seeing a lot of this church two stuff coming on, like, this is not someone else's culture. This is our white culture that lifts up capitalism and says, it doesn't matter how you get there just get there. Well, that's not Christ. That's not kingdom culture. So if we cannot start to reflect on ourselves, especially those who are church leaders and pastors, especially those who are males and white, like let's reflect on ourselves and let's not be afraid of getting offended. Yes. 